Hey everyone, welcome to the live stream for today. Dr. Phil Metzger should be joining us shortly, but as it is three on the dot, I just wanted to start the stream and see if some of you guys would begin joining. We're going to talk a lot today about the thing I've been silent about for no particular reason, but of course, the Odysseus lunar lander. We're also going to talk about Starship, as it seems that for potentially on Pi Day, March 14th, we could see the third launch. Sometime this March, I think it's going to happen. So we're going to talk about Starship. We're very excited for the third launch. Uh, we think a lot will go right this time compared to the first two, and we still haven't had a launch for 2024. So um, I actually just got back from Starbase late last night. I drove down there to try and do a Starlink test. That did not work so well for various reasons. <laughs> um, I also broke my microphone, but I was able to fix it with a relatively cheap uh, piece of, of equipment. Um, so that's the good news. Um, of course, we still don't know when the Starship launch will be, but I'm thinking that Odysseus, who might have a chance, or Odie, of coming back to life, of waking up, may come back online in about two to three weeks. So we could see a, a Starship launch coincide with our little scrappy guy, Odie, uh, waking up. But some people have said, hey, why have you not talked about the Lunar Lander? Um, I was, of course, in Florida doing my Zero-G adventure. That took a lot of life out of me <laughs> due to feeling very sick on that one. And it looks like Dr. Mesker just joined us here. So let me add him in. Hello, how are you doing? Hey, Ellie, I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Are you, are you uh, out of town right now? No, I got home really late last night, um, exhausted, Same. had planes, buses, ferries, uh, flying through turbulence, almost throwing up in the airplane. No. It was quite a no. trip. Okay, well, we are live, but no way. Really? <laughs> yeah. It was, um, yeah, I went to Martha's Vineyard, and the morning of the trip, they emailed me and said, well, you might not be able to get here because we're having a winter storm, but if you want to try, then come on and we'll just see what happens. So I said, yeah, I mean, heck, you know, let's try it. So I got there and my plane from Boston to Martha's Vineyard was canceled because of the storm. So they said, buy a ticket on the bus, go down to Woods Hole. There's a ferry. The ferries are canceled too, but maybe there'll be one that'll go across. And so I waited on the docks. It was really <laughs> cold. And sure enough, there was one of the ferries that decided to go ahead and do a run at 5 p.m. So I got across to Martha's Vineyard. I made it in time to give my talk. And then the next morning, the um, storm was died down. It was still real turbulent, but the uh, Cape Air charter line or airplane line was running. And I didn't realize when I went out to the runway, it was this little dinky airplane which had four rows of two seats each. And you had to squeeze in. They, they take all of your carry-ons like purses and cameras and they put them inside the engine in the wing. There's a little hatch in the engine because you can't even take anything inside the airplane with you. It's so small in there. And oh. um, it was bumpy. And I was like doing the mental game of, okay, I'm not going to throw up. I'm not going to throw up. I don't normally get sick, but I normally, on these zero gravity flights, I normally have to do the psychology of convincing myself I'm not going to get sick. And I had to do it on this flight too. <laughs> Well, that's why I'm jaw dropped over here because I just had my zero G experience. I got very sick. And, I you know, I, as I understand, you're pretty yeah. good at those. You have a lot of experience on zero G. So to hear that just a, a plane ride made you feel quite nauseous is, is surprising to me. Well, I every time I do a campaign, these campaigns are either two or four days in a row of flying um, for zero G. And um, usually on the first day, about the 10th parabola, I start to feel like I'm going to throw up yeah. and then I just have to convince myself, you know, I'm not going to, I'm going, I'm okay. I'm okay. And after two or three more parabolas, then I'm okay. And then usually the rest of the week I'm fine. But yeah. I, every time I do go through that. Yeah, I was, uh, for me, and we'll just talk briefly about zero G for me, I went from. I'm not sure how I'm feeling to throwing up probably within two minutes. They were like, okay, well, you know, we'll strap you back in the seat and maybe just sit one or two out. And like, before I knew what was happening, I was like, 
oh no, I'm like full on like vomiting. Like I, you know, like, okay, I'm vomiting again. Okay. Again, again, happened four times. And then I was like, there's no way I'm getting out of the seat. <laughs> like, I just want this to end. I wasn't yeah. quite as, I wasn't quite as, um, you know, terrible as the, the, the man that you once referenced really yeah. losing his mind. Uh, but yeah. I can, I can understand the misery a lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so just the, in case you have viewers here from different than last time, a friend of mine who he used to go a lot and he would always take the drugs. Like I always take the drugs too. Um, NASA, NASA has a, a doctor, a flight surgeon that would go with you on the flight and administer. And I would always take the, the maximum dose. It's based on body weight. And so I'm a three. And um, one day this guy decided to go without the meds and they're like, are you sure? And he's like, yeah, I've done it so many times. And he was throwing up and he told me later he wanted the plane to crash. He really wanted everybody to die just to make the pain stop. It was so bad. Well, you were saying he was kind of screaming sort of maybe not so nice things, right? Well, I don't remember. I don't remember that. Um, okay. Maybe we're miscommunicating, but he, he laid down on his back the rest of the day. You know, we got back to the zero gravity yeah. office yeah. and we have these tables where you work on your experiments. Well, he got up on one of those lab benches, lying on his back with his eyes closed, not moving. And he stayed there all day. You yeah. know, you keep looking over there all day long. Yep, he's still lying there, not moving all day long. He it, was so yeah, sick. it's it's it really takes the life out of you. And like once you're sick, you're like even even when you get back on the ground, that adrenaline dump is so powerful. Like I slept for two hours after that, yeah. and I just was like exhausted, you know, um, yeah. and like. I, I didn't realize until I looked at a picture of myself after that I took with my boyfriend, me with my thumbs down and him smiling. My face is like pale white. And some oh, of the wow. other people, they're like, dude, you looked like, you know, you were sick. Like you looked like you'd seen a ghost, you know? So it's very, um, it's very unfortunate. I did take two non-drowsy Dramamine. I wore the relief band. Someone wants to know from you, do you use the scopolamine patch? Well, we were flying official NASA flights, and so they had a, a, med a, a medication they would give us. It was actually a cocktail of two drugs. One was, um, a, a, well, I, I don't know the medical term. One was a downer, and one was an upper. And so the <laughs> downer was the one that makes you not get sick. And right. then they gave us an amphetamine, speed, to counteract the drowsiness. And so, um, and so you feel like you're buzzed you know during the flight you feel like wow i'm like three inches behind my eyeballs <laughs> and um the whole flight you feel weird and then when they wear off they don't wear off at the same speed apparently and so they tell you don't drive to lunch you know let somebody else drive you to lunch and sure enough you know there's like about a two hour period where you feel drunk at least i did i felt yeah. drunk for about two hours after the flight so it was kind of weird um one flight I mean, they would always tell us, take the maximum. You got to take it. You're going to get sick if you don't take it. One flight, they ran out of the threes and because they were little pre-made pouches. And, and so they said, well, just take a two. And I said, but I'm a three. I need three. And they said, oh, you'll be okay. You'll be okay. And, and I, was, I was thinking like, this goes against everything you've ever said to me. You know, you've always said you must take the maximum. But the one time they run out of it, they're like, oh, you don't really need the maximum. <laughs> but <laughs> but it was OK. I didn't get sick. I, but I always have the head game, you know, but um, and I managed to get through it. Well, Nicole Stott, who is an astronaut, she told me that during training she would get an injection. Have you gotten the injection? No, but on the NASA flights, if you get sick, they give you the injection. They um take you to the back of the plane and strap you in. And then they give you this big injection to just basically knock you out for the rest of the flight. But, oh, um, yeah, wow. that's what I've seen them do that to people during the flights that I went on. Wow. That's insane. Um, <laughs> <laughs> could have done that for me. Tranquilize me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was like, man, I'm scared of the idea of skydiving, but if I had a parachute right now, I might just do it. <laughs> yeah, I know the feelings. It'd be a good business model because they have a few periods where they like level out and take a break. So let the people who want to learn how to skydive 
skydive in those, in those you know, transitions. I'm serious. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I don't know if you watch the show, Nathan, for you, it's a Canadian funny comedian business guy and he does ridiculous business ideas, but I'm like half skydiving, half zero G. But on my flight, nine people threw up. Wow. Nine. Yeah. That's insane. That's Well, it's, it's something, it's like your body trying to protect yourself because you feel like you're going up and down. You know, it's, um, let me say how to say it. It, I've been told it's not the low gravity that gets you sick. It's the high gravity Yes. because between every low gravity, then they pull out. Yeah. And uh -huh. during that high G pull out, you know, you're actually curving, you know, yeah. it's like right. you're on a merry-go-round going around a curve. And if you turn your head, you get this Coriolis force. So you're curving in this way, you turn your head this way. It makes it feel like you're turning your head this way. Yes. Because it's the cross product of the two vectors. And so you turn your head this way, but you feel like you turned it this way. And your brain says, whoa, that wasn't right. What I felt was a different feeling than what my head actually did. I must be poisoned. I got to get the poison out. And so it makes you throw up to get the poison out. That's what I've been told is what's going on there. So I'm actually going to, let's see if this will work here. So this is the flight path that we took. Courtesy to Scott Manley for animating this for me. Um, is that over the? Uh, is that from Texas, from Ellington Field? No, this is out of Orlando. So you can see the first oh. three here are the lunars. We did three lunar parabolas, and then we went to, into the zero G passes. Now I counted uh -huh. sixteen, including the lunar. They told us they were going to do twenty total because they had to move our flight up last minute, and as a consolation, they wanted to do even more. So it's weird to me that I only count 16 and that's including three lunar. However, this gives you guys at home a better idea of what this looks like. And one of the reasons that we got sick or, you know, had a propensity for that, according to the flight attendant, is it was very turbulent that day. And then we did a lot of turns. As you can see, we're turning, we're turning. So yeah. I was, uh, was this the zero G corp? Uh, who sent me this? No, no. Did you fly with the oh, Zero yes. G Corporation? Yes. Yes. So I was on their first NASA flight because they had a contract. I don't know if they still do, but they got a contract from NASA. So I was the guinea pig group that um, were trying to verify if they could get the contract or not. So I had flown on the NASA airplane, the Weightless Wonder, and we were the last ones to fly the Weightless Wonder. And they said, OK, you, you're all going again on this airplane. And so and so um, they had a they had a um, accelerometer on the plane to measure how, how accurately they got each gravity level because that matters for research flights. And they, they were including the high G turns, you know, they're pulling like two G's on these turns and um, we take high G data during the turns. And so they were trying to hold it exactly at, I think it was really 1.8 G's. Yes. And um, unfortunately they were going a little too high and a little too low and it was, wow. It was going out of bounds during the pulls. And, and so the NASA test director said, no, you, you're, oh, and they were getting paid by the parabola. And so they said, no, you're not getting paid for that one. That one went out of limits. And so they said, okay, we're going to go again because they wanted to get paid. Yeah. We went around and around and around and around and like still not in limits. Okay, we're doing it again. And we were all pinned on the floor, you know, doing two Gs, like laying on the floor. Uh, for like five or 10 minutes. And finally the NASA guy said, you're not getting paid and you're not doing any more two G's stop it. And so <laughs> we went on to the next part of the flight, but oh um, yeah, God. that was, that was pretty wild. Lying on the floor, pinned down at two G's for like five or 10 minutes. <laughs> I, Oh my God. Even the 30 seconds, I was like, oh, just like goose frava, you know, mind over matter. Like, it's just, it's like, even like lifting your hand a little bit, like, it's so weird. It takes so much energy. You know, you're not, your body's not used to it. You can imagine what yeah. it would feel like. And then I'm like getting B-roll for my video and you see astronauts training up to 8G. <laughs> like what? Insane. Yeah. Insane. It's pretty freaky. Did you ever, did you ever drop something during 2G part, you know, lift it up and drop it to watch it fall? I threw up in 2G. Uh, well, I guess that might count. The thing that amazed me is, you know, you're holding like a, a bag of tools 
and it feels twice as heavy, you know, of course, but yeah. it's not just that it feels twice as heavy. When you let go, it goes boom, so fast to the ground. Oh, wow. And they tell you that's why you're not allowed to stand up. I mean, eventually they would let you stand up. We were, I would stand up to try to play like I was cool, you know, during the um, later flights. So, but at first they, they tell you, you must lie down. And um, the, the reason why is because if you fall and you start to put your hands out to catch yourself, you will not get your hands out fast enough. You'll hit the ground with your face before your hands get out there because oh, you God. fall so fast. Yeah, it's a, it's a crazy experience. Ross is saying, be grateful you did only 16 parabolas. And yes, but what about the people who paid for, you know, I guess they didn't pay for 20, they paid for 15, but you know, it's, it's tough because you're sick, but everyone else, you know, they they have a right to enjoy it. They paid a lot of money to be there. So it's like a weird sort of, you know, not, not everyone's going to be happy, but, um, <laughs> but I primarily reached out to you, not about zero G. I haven't talked about the, the lunar lander, um, yet mm -hmm. of Odysseus and intuitive machines. Um, partially because, you know, I just don't want to embarrass someone for breaking their leg. I've broken my leg and I know what it's like. I'm kidding, but really I've been, I've been busy. And so it's time to talk about it. Um, and so, yeah. you know, I, I don't know how much you're following it. We are mm -hmm. hoping that Odie wakes up in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. There's a possibility, um, you know, obviously a lot of the kind of mainstream Americans are wondering, was this a success? Was it not? So let's break it down. Yeah, so I, I've been thinking about it a lot, following it, and I've had so many interviews with newspapers and radio and TV over the last week because of the mission. Because, you know, I tweeted about some things on X, Twitter, X, and a lot of people in the media thought it was interesting. So I got so many calls. But, um, yeah, a, lo a lot of these uh, reporters are asking the question, was it a success or not? It's like you want to boil it down to it was a success or it was a failure. Which is it? And and so I'm on the side of saying it was a success. It was a really cool mission. I mean, yeah, a little bit a problem there. You know, broke a leg, fell over, didn't have a great radio communication, and so got less data back. But but there was so much that went right on that mission. Um, the fact that they got to the moon, did orbital insertion. They deorbited, they did entry and descent, they did landing, they actually did stick the landing before it fell over. They did establish radio contact, they did get a lot of data back and pictures. And so I would say, I'd even say it was like a 99% success when you consider wow. how many things went right. Um, you know, one little laser altimeter problem, which really boils down to a procedural, a pre launch procedural problem that caused this string of other failures. Um, the, and here's the good thing. They will never make that mistake again. <laughs> you know, it was, I, it was a procedure. They forgot to un unsafe the lasers before launch. I, I was, I was reading about that. And not only did they just randomly kind of check that early, which if, if they hadn't, then they would have had, you know, minutes to pr probably not figure it out. Um, but how bad does that person feel that, you know? Oh, I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Um, you know, I think NASA paid like 180 million or 188 million. That was just NASA. You know, there were other customers. So the total cost of the mission was hundreds of millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and they still got a huge amount of value from it. You know, it didn't right. zero the value. It was, I would say it was it was so much of a success that I would say NASA got their full money's worth out of it. But, you know, for as small amount as NASA paid for a planetary landing. But, um, but yeah, they've, the person who forgot to unsafe the lasers pre-launch, and I don't know if they had a procedure. Did they check it off that it was done even though it wasn't done? Right. I don't know, but they must have felt so bad. And oh, okay. I got to tell you this. So um, I've been flying lasers on a rocket in Mojave in California. So um, I've been working on a sensor or started way back when I was at NASA. And then when I, I got to the University of Central Florida, we came up with a way to extend the concept of this sensor. And so I partnered with Addie Dove, Dr. Addie Dove at UCF. And so we built this laser based sensor. It shoots four laser beams, red, green, blue, and violet. Um, and we put it on a rocket 
And so during a lunar landing, the lasers shine down through the blowing dust and we've, ex we've developed methods to extract information from the scattered light in those laser beams. So we have cameras watching the scattering light and we're right now we're still developing the algorithms, but we have a, um, an engineer in our, in our group writing some new cutting edge algorithms to extract the data. But um, so we were putting these eye hazard lasers. Um, they're so bright that even just the instantaneous light beam going across your eyeball and you're blinded for life. You know, there's no recovery. So that's, you know, these are, this is what happens with these lasers. They would instantly blind you for life because of that. You've got to have really sure way to make them safe for ground testing because you cannot take the risk of somebody accidentally bumping a switch and it coming on, you know, you've got to know that it, when it's off, it's off and it's not coming on. That means you design in a method of ensuring it can't accidentally come on. In other words, you're designing into the system a single point failure, and you've got to remember to undo that failure before launch. Wow. Because if you forget to undo that before launch, there is no way to turn it on. You, I mean, it is designed to not be overridable by, you know, by intent to protect people working around it. So, so that's what happened was they had a safing system designed to be a single point failure and they just forgot to unsafe it before launch. And then that caused the altimeter to not work. They did this patch. The patch helped, but it didn't give them real-time computer updates. So the lander thought it was 100 meters higher than it was. So it hadn't finished slowing down. It hadn't finished the translational velocity. So it hit the ground going too fast. It skidded, broke a leg, and fell over. Everything that happened bad came down to that one procedural problem. If, if they hadn't made that procedural problem, who knows, maybe the whole mission would have been perfect. Oh, my gosh. What a what a bummer. <laughs> yeah, but, but, but the point, the, the positive side of that is that's all it was. It was just a procedural problem, and they'll never make that mistake again. I guarantee that. It's amazing to me just... I mean, there are so many things to keep track of and, you know, make sure that you've done correctly, um, especially when things are going into space. It's just it's the littlest things. It's like it's like, the, you know, the big things you get right and then you 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 forget about something. Um, yeah, it's crazy um, it's here. So here's some just B roll of of uh, of the lander. And Ross has a good question for you here. What lessons need to be learned from the IM-1 mission about how to safely land a tall, upright lander on the moon? And are there implications for Starship HLS? Well, yeah. Um, so a lot of folks have been saying that it was a mistake to try to land a tall lander on the moon. And I, I respectfully disagree. I think it's a legitimate design choice. Of course, if you had a short, squatty lander, then you're going to have more margin against dipping over. But um, a well-designed system can land upright on the moon like that. And so if you're, if you're willing to design all your systems to function with less margin, you can do that. So if you've got legitimate reasons why you need to give up some of that margin, then it is a legitimate design decision. And um, so, you know, it was, I, I think, probably if they hadn't made that one pre-launch procedural error, they probably would have landed upright because the, it was designed well. They, they, it was really smart people. Um, they had a system to zero out the velocity before touchdown, and it just didn't know the altitude because the laser wasn't coming on. So I think it would have been all a success. But, um, but um, along the way over the past week, everybody thinking and talking about it, it was interesting. Um, I did the math on how tippy a lander would be on the moon versus on earth. Like if this is your lander, so it's taller, this is my microphone, the microphone box, by the way, actually let's use a phone. It's a little taller. So, you know, this is the, uh, the vehicle and it's got the legs that come out to the corners of the phone. So this is the aspect ratio and, um, actually, yeah. Okay. Well, anyways, um, <laughs> I'm trying to find a show and tell object using what I've got available. Okay, this one is skinnier. So taller and skinny, the legs come out wider. Okay, so there's, yeah. imagine the legs coming out. So um, on the moon, if you're sliding sideways, 
you've got this kinetic energy. And then when it, when the leg touches down, here's the leg, it touches and it tips up and over that leg. You know, it, it has to go up and over as it falls. And so it's on that leg, it's lifting up as it goes over. And the question is, is the sideways energy enough to overcome the potential energy to lift it up? But the thing is, the sideways energy doesn't depend on gravity, but the energy to lift, to tip it, does depend on gravity. So you're reducing the potential energy that it has to overcome, but you're not reducing the energy that it has, you know, which as it comes in. Oh. And so it takes less less sideways velocity to tip it over on the moon. So you can do the calculation, like if the lander is shaped like the IM lander, um, and if it's right at the limit of tipping with legs shaped like this, well, let's put it on the earth where gravity is higher. It's more stable now in 1G. And so to be the same amount of tippiness, the legs would be straighter. And I calculated how straight would the legs be to have the same tippiness on earth that it had actually did have on the moon. The answer is the legs straight down. If the legs were straight down, that would be the same tippiness of that vehicle that it actually experienced on the moon. So when you look at that lander, don't picture its legs going out. Picture its legs going straight down, landing on the earth. That's how tippy that thing is. So yeah, there's they're giving up some stability margin by, by choosing that design. But even so, you can have electronics on your lander that do the navigation and do the flight controls and um, select an area that's good terrain to be able to land. And um, they believe they could do it, and I believe they could do it. They just had an unlucky break this time. So I know that Odysseus is part of the CLIPS program and had you know scientific payloads on board. Are those just like... Is, it, is there anything that's going to come from those? Are they going to be able to carry oh, out? Yeah. Well, I don't know how much data they got. Um, I know that they were providing data to the payload providers. And um, I know that some of the commercial payload, the non-government payloads also got data. Um, but I don't know how much they got. The one I was most interested in was scalps. That's the... Um, the stereo camera system that was going to measure the blowing soil and dust. From what I gather, the, the stereo cameras did not work for some reason. I, I just heard that as a rumor. I don't, I don't, that's not official news, right. but um, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I've heard that they were going to have three cameras or four cameras on scalps. I don't know how many it ended up actually being. So I'm still hoping they had some cameras that took, plume uh, blowing soil data, um, but I haven't heard yet. However, I did look at just the, the regular spacecraft images of the plume blowing the soil during descent, and you can see a lot of interesting physics in those pictures. Um, so I, I, I mean, if you've got those pictures to put up, I could, I could talk yeah. through some of the cool physics that you can see in them. Are you able to share your screen if you look at the present option on your end? Um, well, I don't have the pictures ready to, to share. Oh, okay. Uh, let me try to get them up. What should I look up? Um, intuitive machine, um, landing pictures. Gotcha. There were, there were only a few that were released, but the ones that showed the blowing rocks. Let's see here. Here, I'm just going to pull and Boy, I'm, I'm really tired from travel. I'm looking at myself on camera and I go, oh, <laughs> I really hey. look tired, but I am tired. I I appreciate you not canceling. <laughs> um, I, I totally I, understand. Yeah, I only got an hour of sleep before the trip, and then I only got a few hours of sleep last night. Oh, well, that's just not good for you. <laughs> I know, but, you know, in the space program um, in NASA, we used to have to work crazy hours all the time because I was working on the shuttle and then the space station, and um, we used to say that you have to be space-hardened to work on the space program because you know electronics are space hardened they're, they're made to withstand the radiation of space but we used to say the employees had to be space hardened as well so that's just the way it is in the space world you work crazy hours yeah you do what you have to do so um yeah i think i think the one right in the middle there probably or the one or the one on the middle right or 
Not this Any one. Of those that show, the, the, actually, the big one on the top right, the the big one up there. Um, Wait, I don't on. know which one you're. Oh, 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 sorry, sorry, we're not on the same. Uh, wait, yeah, wait. Where your, your your mouse just went over at the top right, where you see the legs and the blowing <laughs> dust. Hold on, this is so complicated to do all of it. Uh, I have to I have to go to a different tab. That's why. <laughs> okay, all right. Is that it? There you go. Yeah, yeah so you can see some really cool physics in that. Um, of course, you can see the dark rocks that are blowing, and um, that's interesting because. If we can get an estimate of how fast the soil was blowing, then we also get an estimate of how many rocks are in the soil. Because, you know, if it removed one centimeter of soil and you've got that many rocks, that gives us a calibration of rocks per, per centimeter of depth, you know, over that area. And so it tells us a little bit about the geology. Oh, there's a dinosaur. Oh, no, not the. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Okay, speaking of geology, we got dinosaur fossils on the moon. <laughs> um, so, but then, 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 in addition to the rocks, you can see the generally grayish, you know, bright, bright gray cloud, and you can see little hints of darker areas underneath it. Those are craters. Hmm. You see, like the circular crater that's um, on the lower left side with a rock over the over the yeah. crater. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a crater. Now you can see that it's a little bit darker, but not super dark. Well, if we get a picture back after the dust stops blowing, then you'll get a contrast of how bright it is outside versus inside the crater, right? And so you'll have you'll you'll know how bright it is in the crater and outside the crater, both with and without dust. And with those four data points, you can actually calculate how much dust is in front of that crater. And so if you know how much dust is there, you and we know how fast the rocket was blowing, then we can um, calculate how much dust should be over the crater as a function of this parameter. There's one parameter in the physics that we don't know yet. And so you can plug in different values of that parameter until what we predict matches what we see. Oh, wow. And so we can actually calibrate the erosion equation, which you can't do on the earth because it's, it's impossible to blow a sufficiently large rocket inside a vacuum chamber while maintaining vacuum with supersonic dust, which destroys vacuum pumps and have the entire experiment inside a, a reduced gravity airplane. You know, you can't do that. Um, like you, you could try to do some of those things, but you can't do all of them. And then you especially can't do it with real lunar soil, um, lunar dust that's got the actual geology of the moon. So, so this allows us to calibrate the physics of erosion on the moon. Just, just two pictures, this picture plus another picture after the dust clears. Um, and so we get really important science from it. Um, another thing that we can get from, from, um, oh, there you go. Um, you know, the, uh, you're going to have to do some calibration of the two images because it looks like the, the contrast and the, you know, the exposures are not the same on the images. But hopefully they've got that metadata on the camera settings for the two pictures. Um, if not, you can still, there's ways you can solve it. Like, look how the sky is not very black in this picture. But let's go back to the previous picture. Do we see any of the sky in the previous one? Um, yeah, see the sky way up in the upper left? It's actually a lot darker sky up there. So oh, wow. you, that's because the camera settings are not the same. So you can actually calibrate that out to take care of it. But, um, but I think with those two pictures, you can actually get some really good science. Um, but there's another thing in this picture that's really interesting. The first one? There we go. Yeah, so um, look at the... Um, where it says intuitive machines, go to the left a little bit, and there's this little grayish bright streak that's diagonal. I don't know if this you can guy? point at it with a mouse. Is it this guy? Um, I don't see your cursor. Oh. Well, you anyway, there's some gray streaks that they point back towards the foot pad of the lander. I see actually like a real short one, and then I see two long ones. And then there's some even tinier ones that are up under the leg, like right there between the two legs, 
if you scroll scroll it back up a little bit, no, the other way, down or up, I don't know, but yeah, right there, right between. So the, see the two foot pads, yeah, right between yeah. the two foot pads, but a little closer to the right one. There's a gray streak. It looks like a looks like a tic tac. It's longer yeah. than a tic tac, but that that thing right there is dust. That's just dust. It's not a rock or anything. But it's um, it's a little region of dense dust. It's denser than the dust around it. And it makes it look like it has a 3D shape. It looks like it's sticking up above the dust, but it's not really sticking up above the dust. It's inside the same dust cloud with all the other dust, but it's a little cylinder of, of space that has denser dust than the other dust around it. And the reason why there's denser dust right there is because up at the very top of that shape, you can't see it through the dust, but there's a rock sticking up out of the soil. And that rock is currently being undercut by the gas. And so the gas is flowing around the rock, scouring out, digging out around the rock. And eventually the rock's going to come free. And once that rock comes free, it'll look like all the other rocks you see. And see, all those other rocks don't have those dust tails attached to it. It's right. just the rock that's still attached to the soil that hasn't been liberated yet that's got the gas digging it out. See, that rock, even though you can't see the rock, we know it's there because we see that cylinder of dense dust. All that dense dust is being released at a higher density because that's where the rock is being exhumed. Um, and so whenever you see that happening, you, you can tell two things. First of all, you, you know about the width of the rock because the width of the rock is equal to the width of that dust tail. Um, and you also can tell how long the rock has been getting under, uh, undercut because the length of the dust tail. It, as soon as it started getting dug out, that dust tail started, and then it's going with the gas, getting longer and longer. And then when the rock gets free, that dust tail is going to blow away, and, and it won't it won't be making the dust tail anymore. So that length of that dust tail tells you how long the rock has, has been undergoing um, excavation. And um, so you see some of these tails are longer than others, um, but you can count them and look at how long they are and get statistics on how often rocks get dug out. And so that hmm. gives us information. Not Now the, if you assume the rocks are roughly round, which is an approximation, you know, but it's not a, not a horrible approximation. If you assume they're approximately round, then the width of it is equal to the thickness of it. And so the length of the dust tail until the rock gets released tells you how long the soil took to get lowered to that depth. You know, it's digging out the rock and now it's dug out to that depth and the rock gets loose. And so it stops making the dust tail. So those dust tails tell us a lot about how the soil is being eroded, how fast it's being eroded, and how many rocks of different sizes are in the soil right there. So even from a picture like this, you can actually get a lot of really cool physics. Wow, that's incredible from just a picture. You, you're seeing a lot more than I am. The picture's worth maybe you know, 10,000 words for you. Well, I've spent um, like 25 years staring at these pictures, trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> um, Michael, thank you for the super chat. I'm not exactly sure. Uh, Ellie and Dr. M, I am suspects, a di so intuitive machine suspects Odysseus landed in an up incline or a rock. So that is still above horizontal. Do you know Maybe a little bit. Is yeah, I, I haven't sorted that through. I've been reading what Scott Manley says. It looks like he's been paying very close attention to it and, and sorting it all out. But the little bit that I've read, it looks to me like the the lander is at like a 30 degree angle. Yes. I, I'm guessing 30 degree from horizontal, although some people have said 30 degrees from vertical. I don't know. But yeah, it either landed on a slope or it landed with his head on a rock. So it didn't go all the way down apparently. Um, maybe that has helped them to get some of the communication link, you know, so they could get some of the data back. Maybe it, it helped a little bit. So as I understand in three weeks, you know, Odie could, could get enough solar power generated to, to come back to life. Correct. Yeah. Um, so when I was at NASA 20 years ago, no, no spacecraft had ever survived the lunar night. 
and um, without without heating. You know, we we put payloads on the moon during Apollo, and they had nuclear power on you know nuclear decay to provide power, but um, nobody ever knew if you could let a spacecraft that was solar powered go uh, to sleep in the super cold lunar night which which is really cold you know when when you're in the desert and the sun goes down it gets really cold um, because the dry air doesn't hold the heat in very well but when there's no air it's even worse you know it's like way worse than a desert because all, all the heat goes out and it gets super cold on the moon and so um, we back in NASA, back in those days, we used to think that it was impossible. Nothing would survive the lunar night. And we were always talking about what can we do to solve this problem? Well, finally, the Chinese lander, um, like Chang'e 3, had a little rover, the U-2 rover. And if I recall, it woke up after the first lunar night. Now, I've heard conflicting stories about how functional it was. Did everything wake up? Was everything still functional? I don't know. But but when it woke up again, everybody was was thinking, wow, that's pretty amazing. We didn't know that could happen. And then the Chinese, I mean, the Japanese slim lander that's on the moon right now, it just woke up again. So we've seen at least two cases of vehicles that are able to, to get more sunlight after the lunar night and come back alive. So um, yeah, Odysseus might do this as well. That'd be really cool if it does. Yeah. Uh, Mark wants to know, why did they go with six legs instead of three like Surveyor? Yeah, I don't know the design decisions. Um, I, I really don't know. Um, maybe it was mechanical loading. You know, it, it had to hit, carry a certain amount of weight, um, not only on the moon, but also during launch and you know, had to carry the payload, uh, the payloads and the propellant. So maybe it was a structural analysis. Um, maybe they, um, maybe it was because to fit the, the payload fairing in the rocket, they couldn't have longer legs. So that was as long as they could make them. And so maybe they weren't able to get as long, you know, of, of an angle as they wanted. And so to make up for that, they just had to go with more legs to bear the, the load. That, that's what I would guess. But there, there's another thing, a six-legged or a, a four or five, you know, it, it's more stable than just a three-legged. I mean, if you have three legs, then if you just add more legs between them, it, it, just, it just makes it harder for the vehicle to tip over. Um, mm -hmm. So it does increase the static stability. Um, then you can get into discussions about what if one leg breaks. So a three-legged vehicle, if one leg breaks, it's going to go down. A four-legged vehicle, if one leg breaks, it's not stable. It, it, it might get lucky and balance, but it could fall over. A five-legged is marginally, you know, like if you have a, a diamond ring, if you have five prongs, you can lose a prong and the ring won't get lost, but it's borderline, you know. Six prongs or six legs gives you a, a, a degree of margin so that if you lose one, you're really sure that you could stay up. Now, okay, they lost a leg and they didn't stay up, but there was a lot going on. You know, it was during the dynamics of landing. It was on a slope. There may have been a rock. I heard a rumor maybe more than one leg got damaged, but I, that's not official. That was just somebody on Twitter speculating. But there was a lot going on. But in general, you know, six legs does give you more, more margin for stability. Right, right. Uh, Ross wants to know, and I, you know, I don't know if you know all the answers, but I'm going to ask him anyway. How did intuitive machines manage to avoid boil off of cryogenic propellants on their small Odysseus lander for days after launch? Yeah, I don't know the details of their design, but I, I do know that time was of the essence. You know, it's not like other missions where you could just loiter forever um, right. because there, there is a boil off rate. Um, unless you've got active cryogenic cooling on your vehicle to continuously take the heat out fast enough, then you are going to be boiling off and losing propellant. And so you've got to have an extra margin of propellant. You've got to allow for the boil off. And so it must have, I'm just speculating, but it must have been in their mission um, design requirements 
that they, once they got into space, they had to be able to land within a certain number of days because after that, you're not guaranteed to have enough propellant left over. Now, when you design a spacecraft, the way it works is you have top level requirements and then you, you say, okay, to meet our top level requirements, the, the rocket has to do this, the lander has to do this, the payload has to do this. And then, okay, you take the rocket requirements, the propulsion system has to do this, the mechanical structural system, has to, you know, you, and so you flow the requirements down. At every step along the way, they usually put a little bit of margin in. And then when you get to the final bottom tier and you're building that piece, they, they try to exceed the margin, you know? So now, now every piece had design margin to begin with, and then it has as built margin on top of that. And so when you flow it all back up, yeah, we met it, we met it, we met it. By the time you get back to the top, you usually have quite a bit of margin built in. And so, um, so even though they may have said, we only have two days or we only have three days, oftentimes you can actually squeeze out an extra day or two, you know, because of all the margin that ended up. So, um, so I don't know any of the details at all, but I would assume that um, they were tracking it, you know, where they were, they were finding out how well it performed um, in real time, you know, they, they, we designed it, we expect it to be this good, might've actually been better. So maybe they weren't boiling off as fast as they thought, you know, but they were probably working in real time making the decisions. I can't, sorry, I can't give a, a specific answer. It's, it comes down to insulation. And by the yeah. way, let me say methane and oxygen are not the worst. You know, they, they're actually pretty good to deal with um, in space. Um, they do boil off. Um, oxygen will, um, has to be kept pretty darn cold, but the bad one is hydrogen. And so um, if you're not dealing with hydrogen, it's a lot easier, you know, to provide insulation to, to keep the cryogens from boiling off too fast. Well, I did title this uh, Dr. Metzger and Ellie in Space Discuss Starship, so I suppose we shall. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, just really quickly, I mean, it sounds like, you know, this month, hopefully we're going to see the third launch of Starship, the first Starship launch of 2024, we're, you know... Uh, if they want to, if they want to do nine launches, probably got to get going. Um, <laughs> we know that their mishap investigation recently concluded instead of 63 corrective actions, like we had after the first one, they had 17. So that's progress. Wow. All right. Um, yeah. What, uh, you know, what are your predictions? Do you think, do you think it could actually be two weeks away? Um, yeah, I'm sorry. I haven't been keeping track of their, their flight prep. So I, I don't really have an opinion on that. By the way, I have to sneeze. I'm sorry. I'm going to mute oh, you're you good. for a second. <laughs> One more sneeze. Oh, no. <laughs> okay, that one didn't happen. We scrubbed oh. the second sneeze. Um, hey, you did, you did a good job of hiding it. <laughs> <laughs> oh God! Uh, yeah, uh, I just um, I just went down to Starbase, um, and I actually thought about you because I went to my favorite hibachi place down there, and um, some locals struck up a conversation with me. And, you know, one of the, or the husband or whatever said, oh yeah, after that first launch, you know, there was just dust for days and, you know, just covered everything and it was all Starship's fault. And you've kind of told me maybe that's not the case based on like, like collecting the samples. Well, um, yeah, I mean, there was sand that fell from the sky in Port Isabel. Um, so uh, four different people sent samples to us and we analyzed the samples. Um, the, there were two, two questions about human health and then one question about the, you know, what the heck happened so that we can figure out how to prevent it. Um, the human health questions was, what is it made out of? Is it asbestos or, you know, something hazardous? Right. Um, and, or, and the second human health question was how big are the particles? Because if they're small, like, 10 microns or finer, then they could be a respiration hazard. And what we found out is they were just normal beach sand. 
um, it was literally the sand that was under the launch pad that that landed on Port Isabel. So wow. when it when it blew apart the launch pad, the the concrete did not get broken into fine enough people far, fine enough pieces to go that far. So none of the concrete went to Port Isabel. The only thing that went to Port Isabel was sand. And so what that tells us is that the launch pad did not break up into small pieces. It only broke up into big pieces. Okay, and so that's good. So there was no chemical hazard to human health in Port Isabel. The second thing was the size. Um, and they turned out that they it was basically just the size of beach sand. They were like 200 to 500 microns, which is the size of a sand grain. Um, they were not 10 microns. Now, we did find some that were as fine as 10 or 5 microns. There was a tiny amount, but that's that's not a problem because um, beach sand, um, you're allowed to have some exposure level to real fine particles. And this was so far below the hazardous limit that's set by OSHA, you know, the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It's so far below that limit that that tiny amount wasn't a problem. But even more importantly is um, the exposure time was super short. The sand fell from the sky for less than a minute, from what I've been told. And so um, these OSHA limits are based on exposure for eight hours a day, every day for a 20 or 30 year career. You know, so one minute of exposure once in your life is really nothing. But then, um, but it's even less exposure than a minute because it's really no exposure happened. The reason why is because the sand was actually contained in, in water droplets. Um, you can see pictures of the sand falling from the sky on computer screens, and they would make diagonal streaks down the street, down the screen like water droplets, leaving the dust specks in a diagonal streak. And um, people reported that they felt the sand landing on them, and it felt like water. But then when they brushed it, it was dry sand. And when it landed on their shirt, it would make a dark spot like a raindrop. But when they brushed it, it was dry sand. Well, what happened was it actually was water. So that cloud that left the launch pad, that cloud was a cloud of water vapor that actually was the rocket exhaust. You know, the rocket exhaust made a lot of water. And it, the conditions for rain on that day were not favoring rain. And... And so you made a cloud of water on a day that wanted to be dry. And so it would not have rained except that there was also sand blown into the cloud. The sand was circulating around because it was a hot cloud. So it had circulation and that kept the sand from falling out. But the sand um, started to seed the cloud and made raindrops form around the sand grains. And so when the drops grew big enough, then they fell out of the cloud. And the, the drops that fell out of the cloud had the sand grains inside of them. And so there was no dust blowing in the air. It was, it was sand grain that had been stuck together by water hitting the ground. So completely no respiration hazard whatsoever. Um, but it was really cool for us as scientists to see, wow, that really happened? Nobody ever thought you could make a a rainstorm with sandy raindrops from a rocket launch. You know, right. that in the history of the world, nothing like that has ever happened before. Um, and, uh, but also then the last question was, so what the heck happened? And that's how we figured out, well, it cracked the pad. Once it cracked the pad, the high pressure gas drove hot gas under the pad, which vaporized the groundwater mixed in the sand and that buildup of pressure exploded the launch pad. And so the sand that was under the launch pad got blown up into the sky. And that was the sand that fell on Port Isabel. So it was pretty cool from a physics perspective. We learned things. We never knew you could explode a launch pad. But now that we know it, we know that we have to prevent it on the moon. And so we're actually working on ways to prevent launch pads on the moon from exploding. So we actually learned something really important out of this, but we, but we did prove it was not a health hazard. Um, the stuff that fell on Port Isabel. Interesting. Um, let's see. And 
What do you think of SpaceX's approach to technical risk on Starship development? Do they need to be more conservative to avoid FAA mishap investigations, or should they push hard for full reusability? Well, um, yeah, so I I love their technological development approach. Um, I'm a big fan of that approach. So um, there's two, two methods. One is extremely cautious. You design and analyze. It drives the cost super high, but you don't have a lot of public failures. Um, the other way is you test early, test often, fail early, learn a lot. Right. And it's been proven that that is actually a more cost-effective way to do development. The only, the only concerns are safety and look, you know, the look, and if the look affects politics. So, um, so you can manage the safety, you can do that approach. And this gets into the FAA's role. You know, the FAA is supposed to protect public safety and environmental um, regulations, and they're doing their job. Um, and, um, but I, I think you can have both. I think SpaceX can do the rapid development they can they can allow failures to happen. They can learn from it and make progress fast. And it can be done in a way that's not harming the environment and not risking the public. And I, so I th I think space I think the FAA is doing their job. I think they're doing a fair job. Um, they've allowed SpaceX to launch twice so far. I'm sure we're going to have a third launch soon. So um, I I think things are going well. Yeah. No, I'm very I'm so excited for the third launch. It's um. It, it feels like it's very soon. So <laughs> hopefully. Um, yeah. And yeah, so I, I, I know that you're, you need sleep. <laughs> so I thank you. I want everyone to thank Dr. Metzger for coming on today. Uh, an hour talking to you always flies by. It's kind of crazy. Has it really um, been an hour? Wow. It's been an hour. You're very easy to talk to. You're very conversational and you're fun. And so that's okay. hard to I'll find. I'll be glad to come back again whenever yeah. you want to talk about something. Yeah, but you guys, um, you know, thank him because it sounds like you've had a really tough <laughs> sort of week of travels. And an I can adventure. empathize. I can empathize, especially yeah. the uh, the turbulent flight. That's that's You know, that's I'll, I'll tell you this. I mean, it was probably not as bad, you know, pilots, I'm sure they're used to turbulence, but, but for me, I honestly thought this, I said, you know, I might die today. This might be the day that I die. <laughs> so I'm just going to have to be good with that. And I was literally thinking that on the airplane. <laughs> well, that's me. That's me every flight. So, so now, you know, but that's, that's, that's crazy that, um, it must have been, you know, what's weird too. My dad, he, he flies all the time. He travels a lot for work. And he told me the other day, actually LA was having terrible weather and it was the worst flight he's ever been on. It was like nonstop for the whole flight. And he had that same sort of terrible doom and gloom thought of like, oh man, this, this plane might be going down. And, and so it's, uh, it's not good news for someone who's, not comfortable in minimal turbulence to see that veterans like you still can <laughs> come to fear. That's crazy. I wonder what's going on. Well, actually I had this, I've, I've like Googled this because I have this theory that, you know, with climate change, we're probably going to have worse turbulence, like way worse. Right. I hadn't thought about it, but that makes sense. Like it totally makes sense. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I know that like, you know, planes are meant to withstand a lot, but even just the sense of like, okay, well, you know, maybe they'll still get from point A to point B, but our flight's going to start to get really uncomfortable. I don't know. Interesting. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. It's something to maybe, maybe it's something to ask a pilot about. Maybe I need to have a pilot on. You don't, yeah. you're not a pilot, right? Huh? What? You're not a, you're not a pilot. Oh, no. no. Not your fancy. Nope. No. <laughs> well, well, we appreciate you and all of your knowledge. Um, thank you for talking to me, and spending time with us. And um, yeah, definitely want to have you on. Maybe I'll reach out after the Starship launch. My pleasure. Be glad to come back. Awesome. Great. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Have a great rest of your day.
All right. Okay. So I'm still on. Um, thank you for Dr. Metzger for joining us. Uh, I can empathize with having a rough week. Um, luckily, I'm back. You know, I fixed my microphone. Thank goodness. And again, it wasn't the whole microphone that broke. It was a little clip for the receiver that goes into my phone. But luckily, Amazon has next day delivery, and I was able to get that replacement piece and now should be good to go. Um, it's amazing what not having good sound <laughs> kind of kills the whole the whole story. Um, I All I need is my iPhone in my DJI mics. It's very simple, but if I don't have both of those things working, it's especially down in South Texas where it's incredibly windy, uh, it's, it's just, it's very hard to get, to get good, um, good sound. So, uh, thank you guys. I'm glad that you liked the live stream. I'm glad you liked the Starbase coverage. I did what I could. I did some cartwheels at the, at the end of my Starba Starbase visit because I was just so frustrated. <laughs> um, and, uh, thank you for Nicholas, some amazing info. Now even happier that I found my little chunk of Starbase uh, launch pad. Yes, I have two big chunks that are actually in my garage that I, you know, I helped with the cleanup, but I did take them home and um, they're, they're pretty crazy. They're one of them. I, you know, I have to avoid getting tetanus every time I lift it because it's very rusted and uh, chaotic. But um, yeah, I think that, you know, it's interesting to me that those corrective actions have decrease significantly less than a third of of the corrective actions we needed after the first flight so i think that spacex is really on the path to um to you know getting the starship launch correct and uh not having to have a mishap investigation and a delay and a hold up for for several months obviously the time period between uh the second and third launch is still less than first and second but it is, you know, it's something that we all, we are all waiting for. We're all excited for. I was excited today because I had a network news contact me and interview me about SpaceX and about, you know, what's going on down at Starbase. So that was pretty cool. Um, I've been thinking that more people should reach out to me. Not that I'm a you know, a crazy expert, but I think I have been in this, in this, uh, niche, uh, long enough now to be able to, to talk about it and, you know, really get the main message across that what's happening right now is totally exciting. And I was saying this in my interview today, you know, at some point this is going to be commonplace, you know, we're already seeing it with Falcon nine, the workhorse, you know, that Falcon 9 is, the clockwork cadence that we see, uh, it doesn't really phase us that much anymore. I went down to Starbase and someone came up to me and said, uh, you're that girl that missed the rocket launch, huh? And I'm like, yeah, but, you know, it's a Falcon 9 launch. They happen all the time. And so, um, you know, we're not at that point yet with Starship, but, but soon enough we will be. And, it's like, you know, imagine the early days of airplanes. And I feel like we're seeing that right now where commercial space tourism is is about to lift off, uh, no pun intended, but it's, it's let's savor this moment because it's really exciting to sort of be on the forefront of it all. And, um, and I know that you guys are all equally invested just like I am, but um, I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, when I look back on my life, when I'm probably older and have kids, I'll be like, wow, I was able to really like get involved in that, you know, first mover uh, of going to Mars and this whole journey. It's incredible. So I'm glad that we all get to share it. And I'm glad that you guys are into it. Obviously you're into it, <laughs> but I'm very into it too. Um, when will we see you in a network video? So I will hopefully be able to share that once once they edit that. I think they'll probably air it later today. So hopefully I did a good job. You know, it's a little bit nerve wracking being asked questions on the spot. So I respect all of my viewers or I'm a, my interviewees who let me grill them with questions. And I don't really give out a, a question list before. I don't believe in that really. Um, some people really like that, but, uh, yeah, it's, uh, you make a good point. SpaceX has contributed to huge progress in space flight, big things to come. And, 
it's just, it's just exciting. It, it, you know, there's a lot of doubters. There's a lot of people that doubted what SpaceX could do in the very beginning, that it was even possible. And so, um, you know, for a private space company to make such an impact like they have. So hopefully, um, we'll go to Mars and all the people that said that it wasn't possible. Well, we'll say it is check us out. Um, so yeah, I, what is today? It's Friday. Wow. That's crazy. It's been a crazy week. I did not think I'd be going on a very quick notice trip down South. Um, I'm really bummed that the Starlink didn't work. I finally got a hold of Starlink customer support, which of course is not via telephone. It's only by uh, claim ticket email, basically. Um, and they unpaused my service. But it's really a shame that, you know, if you're paying extra for the mobile service, uh, the ability to roam and use it in your RV, you can't just manually press a button on the app or on the website. For some reason that was not available to me. So I don't know if that was just a me problem or if that's, you know, a, an app problem, but that's kind of a problem. You know, when I'm sitting there with all my stuff set up and I, I just can't unpause it to start the service, that's not, that's not, you know, that's not as easy. That's not seamless like it should be. Um, so I will have to bring that back to Starbase now the service is activated, so hopefully it works during my real test, the time when I'm really going to need it, which is during the launch. Um, as long as the launch is before April 3rd, I'm going to be there. However, if it's April 3rd or a little later, I'm going to be in Japan. So yeah, I'm going to miss it if it's if it's later. Um but yeah, I, uh, I I always want to do this, just like chat with you guys a little bit after the live streams. I feel like I always click off. And so just thought I'd wrap up my thoughts here. I'm I'm glad that, you know, about 200 of you guys decided to show up and hang out with me today. Um, I'm glad, Ross, that you enjoyed the Monroe Live podcast interview with me as well. Maybe I'll share that with you guys right now. Uh, Sandy Monroe actually has a podcast that he and his team are doing. So I wasn't actually interviewed by Sandy, um, but let me share this for you guys. Uh, I thought they did a pretty good job, honestly. And some of you guys like to hear some more backstory. So there's a link to the interview um, that Monroe's podcast did. And yeah, if you're bored, you can watch it. You don't have to watch it. Um, Michael Maxi makes a good point. Uh, the Starship launch estimated to be between March 11th and 16th, which is going to be crazy because that is spring break week here. And South Padre Island is a huge attraction, a huge destination for spring breakers. So it's probably going to be nuts. Um, probably going to be nuts. So, yes, I have done several interviews today. So I have to go work out now. It's very important to me to fit, uh, working out in and, um, yeah, I still have a lot of stuff to edit. So bear with me. I have a lot on my plate right now. I'm trying to do it all. Um, but if you guys haven't watched the video that I made from down at Starbase, I made one kind of like a you know, I just slapped something together on my phone. For some reason, that video has almost 40,000 views and it's not the good video. So I'm going to share the good video that I got. I want you guys to watch in, in the comments because maybe, maybe you'll be able to help me out if you haven't seen it. It's, it's very, it's very like strange and frustrating to make videos and have the one that you put more effort into and the one that you think is better kind of bomb. And then the one that you think is not very good do well. I don't, I don't understand. Maybe it's timing. Um, you know, maybe it's, I don't know, has to do with the day that it was released, but part of the reason why, um, here, let me post this comment. So this is the video, like, just go leave a comment, just go like open this link and leave a comment because that will help. Um, you don't have to watch the whole thing, but the reason why I'm sort of more stressed out about this one, I'll just be, I'll just be open with you guys. I um, am trying to get some ad sponsorships because YouTube revenue, if you guys know any YouTube creators, like it's been really rough lately. Um, and for sure X revenue is 
nothing to survive off of, at least for me at this point. So, um, so yeah, so I'm trying to do work with the sponsor and part of the, part of the agreement is that, you know, I make an ad and then I have to hit a certain amount of views that I'm guaranteeing is essentially to get paid for it. So, um, it's an interesting experience. I haven't had this sort of relationship before, um, but it's proving to be a little harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> like if I had put this ad in that nothing burger of a video that for some reason got almost 40,000 views, I would have met the quota, but I put it in the one that I thought was better. And we're still not really at 30,000 views. Another, and I, and by the way, the one that I put it in, the one that I just shared the link is my do good video. So this is my second attempt at getting views because the first attempt that I tried to make was in a video that I made interviewing three astronauts, including Moonwalker. For some reason, that video has done terribly. I, I don't understand it. So sorry, when I go live, you guys are just going to get, you just, you're just going to get me. <laughs> and so I don't know why that video didn't do well. I thought for sure people would be interested to hear from Doug Hurley, who's, you know, flown with SpaceX as well as NASA. Charlie Duke, one of the four remaining moonwalkers. What? Um, Apollo moonwalker. My suspicion, and I may be wrong, but I have to, you know, our brains want to find reasons. And if we don't have reasons, we try to create reasons because that's just the human thing. My suspicion is that there's a lot of moon deniers, a lot of moon landing deniers, a lot of flat earthers. And so having this video where I'm interviewing a moonwalker, <laughs> I think a lot of people are just like deniers and, and don't believe it. And so uh, I have had a lot of negative commentary about it. Oh, the moon landing was fake. LOL. Ha ha ha. You know, why are you interviewing someone who's a fraud? Which is like, what? Like, oh my gosh, you guys. And then I'm wondering, and I haven't looked yet at the, um, let me try and see if I can find this ratio here, but the video might have been downvoted. And, and I suspect that because, you know, it's, it's about a moonwalker as well. Let's see. Okay. So it wasn't downloaded tremendously at all. It downvoted. It has 99.8%, um, you know, likes versus dislikes. So that's actually pretty good. So my suspicion is wrong. I thought a bunch of like the moon conspiracy theorists just banded together and like downvoted the shit out of it. That doesn't appear to have happened actually. Um, it's interesting. Yeah. Looking at my like ratio, I don't usually look at this. Um, looks like a lot of, looks like the most down liked video in a while was the refresh model three video, which also didn't do that good. It's very hard guys. I'm just being transparent with you. It's like, I'll make certain videos that I don't think are going to do that. Well, they do well. I make other ones that I think will be exactly what you guys are looking for and they don't do well. And it's hard to find, you know, the rhyme, the reason, the pattern. Um, so yeah, tank watcher Vince said the astronaut video was super. Uh, yeah, there was corruption involved. There might've been, my dad called me, um, and he doesn't use, you know, he doesn't always watch my, my YouTube stuff. And he was like, that was your best video yet. I can't believe, you know, hearing from those three astronauts. And I'm like, well, I'm glad you liked it because not a lot of other people did. Uh, Ross, thank you for the super chat. I'm glad that you appreciate my coverage. Um, I'm really trying. And so for those of you that watch and support, it really does mean a lot. Uh, it's been, you know, an interesting journey for sure. And, um, and I feel like I'm hopefully getting better at it. So <laughs> I hope that that shows. Um, thank you, Michael, for reposting my zero G interviews. I told you that I was going to do the in-depth, um, you know, review of my experience, which was not that great, to be honest. And I haven't done that yet because I'm waiting on the GoPro footage. So I still don't have the GoPro footage that was promised to me from Zero G. Although they say, you know, give them five to seven business days. So I'm still waiting, but this isn't the last of it you're going to hear. However, I do think you're really going to enjoy my um, personal thoughts on the experience, uh, especially because I got sick and I feel like no one talks about that. I'm not sure why. Um, 
But I'm glad that you guys are able to support. And uh, someone says I'm a pro reporter. I'm doing an awesome job. So thank you. Uh, that's very kind of you guys. And, you know, it's just, it's been, I feel like it's, it's Monday. It's, it's just been a crazy week. It's hard to know what day it is, but um, yeah, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. So my plans as far as travel goes is that I plan to not travel unless there's a launch until my trip in Japan, because that's going to be, you know, quite extensive. Um, so when I've traveled a lot recently, including I just got back from Florida, traveling can really exhaust you <laughs> for sure. Um, thank you guys. Uh, Ross, your insights on the zero G are the most details I've ever heard on the subject. And I think that's true. It surprises me. And I think it's because, you know, of course, most of the zero G stuff is actually research related. And so it's actually, you know, people that are doing this as a career, but then you have this little subsection of people that are just kind of rich enough to pay to do it. It's a very expensive experience. Um, the tickets that were, you know, being sold for my flight were actually $15,000 a piece. And that was because we got a private tour of the Johnson Space Center as well. Um, and again, it's not to like knock zero G. It's an amazing experience that like cannot be replicated. But I guess my point is that it was not perfect for everyone. In fact, it was like not that great in the moment for about half of the people that were customers um, because they were in the sixth section with me barfing. So I guess, um, you know, it's, you know, like what Dr. Phil Metzger was saying earlier in the stream, it is really a, a test of your men mental, you know, willpower, your mentality. Um, it's very hard to kind of calm yourself down when you've just thrown up a lot you keep going through these transitions up, down, up, down, you want it to stop and you're completely powerless. So, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really a surrender moment. Um, and it's, it's hard, uh, you know, and it just gives you a lot of respect for people that do this and, you know, do it for a living, even if they do get sick as well. Um, thank you, Chris, for the super chat. You love my style of coverage and my reporting skills shine. I do appreciate that. Um, it is really fun and I feel very privileged to be able to step out of the TV news world and cover what I want to cover. And obviously that a lot of that is star starship related things. Um, I was down at the border area yesterday. There were tons of local news correspondents, network news people there reporting on President Biden's visit to the border. And, you know, there were a bunch of us standing on a corner awaiting the president to drive out with his motorcade. And then the reporters had to stay behind and do their five and 6 PM live shots. And so I watched some of the footage afterwards because I was interviewed for a couple of them. And I'm thinking, man, I'm so glad that I didn't have to wait around for five hours just to like check the box and do my live stream and say, oh, uh, as you can see, everyone's left now because the event is over, but I still have to stand here anyway because the, the TV station is making me. It's just, there's so many weird things about TV news that people don't even know about. Um, thank you for another very generous super chat, Michael. Where in the Japanese countryside will you and, I think you mean Jonathan, Jack is not my boyfriend's name, Jonathan, uh, I don't know who Jack is, uh, be exploring. We are going to go to Tokyo first. We're landing in Tokyo. And then it's kind of up in the air from there. And that's sort of what we did in Europe. Um, totally spontaneous. We had only planned a week in Ibiza, Ibiza if you're not unfamiliar. Um, and I was like, hey, let's just stay here like another week and explore the different countries that are a very quick plane ride away. And so we ended up going to Barcelona, we went to uh, Venice, uh, Rome and Florence. And so I like the idea of sort of keeping your schedule flexible. I think sometimes people try to over plan trips and there's no room for spontaneity and exploring the place, you know, and I think that's part of what, what's so exciting about traveling is that sometimes just, you know, 
just walking around and, and, and looking at things, it's something, you know, you're not paying for anything. It's just, you're seeing a different way, a different way of life. You're seeing different people, different culture, different foods, you know, different, different languages, maybe on the signs. It's very interesting to me. Um, so I'm very excited. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So if you guys want any coverage of my trip to Japan, let me know. And I guess this would probably be the time where I should probably reach out to JAXA if I'm going to do anything with them. I don't know how media friendly they are, but it's probably worth reaching out. So let me know if you guys, A, want me to try and document some of my Japan travels and B, want me to try and visit JAXA. I think the answer to B would be yes, for sure. <laughs> um, Ross says going full-time independent was a great decision. We're glad you did. It was a great decision. It's been a crazy journey. A lot of times I've doubted myself and if I even made the right decision, but ultimately I feel like it, it was the right decision. Um, and I, and I feel more secure in that sort of the more I, you know, am, am at least increasing my income a little bit. That's obviously a good feeling. Being self-employed is, you know, it's, it's kind of scary. Um, you, you don't have a guarantee of these things and you need other things like, you know, self-insured healthcare. Uh, but what I was going to say is that, um, you know, I've been a little sad recently. One of my biggest supporters and someone who actually was a, a very important part of, of me making the decision to quit and do this full time by sort of helping me financially um, leave my job in TV news. I mean, I would have had no shot in leaving TV news. I was living paycheck to paycheck. I wasn't able to save any money, no way. And so to have this person's support, um, you know, they really believed in me and they, they really appreciated my excitement and enthusiasm for SpaceX and going to Mars and, um, you know, decided to help me out and just, I, I, I barely knew this person. And so anyway, I bring this up because I found out that they died recently, had no idea that they, that they died. Um, I actually met him at one of my meet and greets about a year ago. And so, you know, wow, that's, that's such a, that's such a crazy feeling. And, um, you know, a bit of a, a bit of a loss for, for just my channel. This is someone that, you know, not a lot of you guys, know about this. In fact, hardly anyone does, but I guess I just bring it up because, you know, I, I do want to recognize all the people who have helped me along the way because it, it's not just YouTube revenue that has gotten me here. For sure, it's not just YouTube revenue. A lot of you guys support me on Patreon. Um, you know, just so many people, so many people have helped me on this journey. Let's talk about the fact that I broke my leg uh, almost exactly a year ago, March 5th. A lot of you guys came together to contribute to GoFundMe. You know, I I was still fairly new at, at being out on my own, independent, not getting a TV news salary. And to break my leg after moving to a new place on top of that, a lot of, you know, uncertainty and stress about I was more. I was more stressed about how much my leg was going to cost me than, you know, actually understanding that I had like broken my femur. I'm going to have to get this crazy emergency surgery to put a rod, a permanent rod in my leg. I'm going to have to have a, a much, um, you know, more significant battle sort of in, in getting back to normal than I had anticipated. And um, so a lot of you guys, came together to support me in a time where I was really helpless. I mean, I literally couldn't even walk on my own. So I just, I, I'm, I sit here and I'm so thankful, you know, it's like we, as YouTubers, we have these goals. Uh, I'm pretty close to a hundred thousand subscribers. That's on my mind. I'm like, Oh man, I, I just want to get a hundred thousand. Cause then, you know, like my channel will look really good and I'll have that plaque behind me. But it's like, I have so many people that have supported me, uh, you know, at a, when my channel was much smaller and I, I really, I really am grateful for that. And sometimes I, I forget to like reflect on that. So just wanted to say thank you to everyone. It's been, it's been a crazy journey and, um, you know, it's still pretty much me. I've, 
hired some help very part-time for mostly thumbnails, not so much the editing because I just still, I still think that there's certain things that are irreplaceable about me editing something versus someone else, um, for sure. And so, um, you know, it's still mostly me doing everything and it can be a lot. So I appreciate all of you guys who are patient with me. Um, yeah, so let me, <laughs> Let me read some of your comments because that was a lot of rambling. Um, William, thank you for the super chat. Keep up the hard work. Yes, I need to go to the gym and then I need to get back to editing because I have a lot uh, of backlog that I, yeah, um, need to take care of. Um, sorry, I'm reading some of your comments. Thank you, Ross. He says you're an absolute inspiration for how you battled back from your surgery. Uh, you're a brave and wonderful person. Glad you're on YouTube. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been, it has been crazy. A lot of, you know, some bad things happened last year. Obviously the leg was pretty bad, but amazing things happened last year. And so I'm really excited for 2024. I think already it's been a great year, you know, the zero G flight as, as, as sick as I felt during the flight, it was still an awesome experience. I'll never forget it. That's for sure. And, um, you know, I recently moved into this house with my boyfriend. I love living here. I've tried to make this studio a little better. Um, and yeah, it's just been, it's been really fun. So with all of that being said, I'm going to get going so I can work out. Um, but thank you guys for supporting me. Uh, we have another super chat. Thank you um, for the super chat. Sorry. Yes, I'm sorry that I yacked on the plane. Um, I think just some of the funniest things are like, there's one photo I, I need to share it with you guys of Scott Walter with his Apple Vision Pro. And then you see the guy behind him strapped in the six section and he's like, like wincing and like hating life. And then Scott's just like floating around with Apple Vision Pro. The juxtaposition is hilarious. It's really, it's really giving, um, there's two types of people in this world <laughs> vibes. I should make a meme of that. Um, yes. Uh, thank you for saying that my fast recovery from the broken femur is miraculous. I mean, the fact that I can even do cartwheels in front of starship, you know, and hopefully make it look pretty good, I think is a, is a great testament to, to my leg doing stuff. You know, there's still stuff that I'm not happy with. Um, some very rude people have made comments about my appearance and, you know, of course I'd like to be back to normal, but I have to be really grateful for the fact that I can do cartwheels again. I've been trying to think about, you know, should I make a one year recap of, you know, from breaking my leg to now, or is it even worth it? It's a lot of, some people are like, oh my gosh, we're so sick of hearing about your leg. Other people ask about my leg. So I'll leave it to you guys. What do you think? Is that something that you're interested in or not? Um, clearly it's been, it's been something that I reflect on a lot. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Mark says, how have your cats been with the new house move? Miss seeing them on camera. They've been really good. They're fine but they're locked outside of my office. I cannot deal with them coming in, jumping on the desk. See, jumping on the desk, they shake it. They knock, they knock stuff down. Like I can't deal with it. It makes me resent them and it makes me angry. <laughs> so I have to set a boundary. I have to close the door and then I, you know, regroup with them after I'm done talking to you guys. So <laughs> Uh, anyway, thank you guys. I'm actually going to for real hop off, but it's been great hanging out and I hope you have a great weekend.